we go. All right, here we go. Hello, hello. It is a wonderful, wonderful day. It's a very, very special day. First, I wanna say it's Rosie the Riveter Day, March 21st, 2021. And it's also May Creer's birthday. Happy birthday, May. Thank you. <laughs> we are so, so thrilled that you are here and with us today. I represent Rosie the Riveter Trust. My name is Sarah Pritchard and I'm the executive director. And on behalf of all of us at Rosie the Riveter Trust and the National Park Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical Park, we all want to wish you a very, very happy birthday. How nice. I thank you. That's such a nice honor. And we have um, a number of guests here today. I think that we can be sure to say they're all fans of yours. And <laughs> I do want to let the fans um, know that we send you a warm welcome. And also to let you know that this is a recorded program. So we are recording. And we, you, if you want to say anything in the chat or the Q&A, please do so. If you want to make it anonymous, please go ahead and do so. Um, but we're super excited to start this program. And May, we, do, we did want to surprise you today and give you a virtual gift. So we have a surprise guest, guest that's going to say happy birthday to you. Can, you. can you see her on the screen? No. Okay, hold, hold on. Hi, May. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> You're going to sing happy birthday? I'm not going to sing. <laughs> How are you doing, Phyllis? I'm doing good. Things are going along good. Now I get to see your apartment. <laughs> You're going to I'm see glad you made your band in the background. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on with you, Phyllis? Well, I'm still sorting papers. <laughs> you know? And I'm, I'm down to now going through old pictures and separating them out by family groups. And I'm going to start sending them off in the mail. <laughs> so it'll you know, less... the, solution, the solution to that, Bill, is to get a good shredder. <laughs> well, Phyllis, and I want to, Phyllis, I also want to say hello and introduce myself. We've been on the phone before, but it's so nice to see you in, in um, you know, to see your face. And for everyone that is called and is on our Zoom today, I think it's important that you both meet Phyllis and May in the same room because these are the women that we thank for getting the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor passed. So the, these, these are the legends here. And I just, wanted, I just wanted to ask if you wanted to say anything, Phyllis, before we go into the Q&A with May, anything about your work, how long it took. Um, tell us a little bit about that process and how you work together. Well, May and I knew about each other, but we hadn't met until the uh, convention in Richmond. And it was like, we were just meant to be. We just meshed and over, over time, we've been invited to so many major things and usually they'll comp me on the flights and it, it depends on the airline and the, and the group there. But uh, I think one time as I got off of the plane, they didn't let anybody else off. And they had this thing set up that I was to make a speech to the people waiting to get on for the next flight. And <laughs> just, uh, and then one time they had a poster up there, welcome aboard and balloons and there's always pictures with all the crew and uh, it's been well, so much fun. <laughs> well, well, you, you two, you're absolutely celebrities, you and other Rosies and we just, we thank you so much because um, we have so much to celebrate today being Rosie the Riveter Day and just for all the work that you've done, I just thank you so much. And it's really going to be an exciting year of celebration 
um, especially with the, you know, recognizing the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor. So ha my hat's off to you, to you both. And thank you. Thank you for being the surprise guest, Phyllis. <laughs> well, it's been, uh, May and I have been the perfect team. She does one end of it and I do the letter writing and phone calls, but she goes to all these events. So between the two of us, we've done remarkably well. Uh, we've accomplished a whole lot. Right. And put the word out there that uh, we're still alive and kicking. That's right. <laughs> yeah, be, being an inspiration for, for this generation. It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, thank you so much. And then we'll see you, um, we'll see you Phyllis back on April 11th. We have a, a virtual event that's all about celebrating the rosy gold and we will see you back then. Great. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, how'd you like your surprise, May? I liked it. I talked to Phyllis just a few nights ago, but um, I didn't know that she was going to be on. Well, I had no clue what you were planning for us. Well, that was nice to see it on together. Yeah. Very well, and it's it's no small feat. We actually had um, Congresswoman Jackie Spears' office. One of her staff, Katrina, actually went, drove an hour to her house to set up for that Zoom, and I think that that's a, that's a fun first for Phyllis. Hopefully that one of, of many more, yeah. So May, here we are, We're, this, is, this is your hour, and we, um, we just want to hear from you based on your, it's really just to like, here you are, it's your 95th birthday, all this incredible work you've done to advocate for the Rosies and for what happened on the home front, and now you've made, you've brought it back again into during this pandemic, you have come forward with making masks and causing everyone to sort of get on, get on board, but not only to just wear masks and think about the rosies, but really that we can do it. What you did with sewing masks and giving them out for free brought everyone that sense of like all together we can keep our community we can keep people safe we can get through this together tell me how it feels that you are being called from the news networks from the daily shows and your your name and your you know your photo is across different magazines and newspapers how are you feeling about that it's really um it's hard to describe you know, I love what I'm doing. I've loved what I've done all along. And when Senator Casey called me to tell me we'd gotten the gold medal, he asked me how I felt. And I said, you know, getting the medal was my main purpose, but the journey getting there, the people that I've met along the way, just absolutely amazing. And I'm just so proud of that. And as far as masks go, I made about 300 masks for, to keep my rosy legacy alive. And I just give them to all the people that had helped us do all of these things ahead of time. And of course it went viral. And when it went viral, we just had requests from everywhere, even six other countries, even wow. Puerto Rico's request, of course they're not a different country, but it was just absolutely amazing. But what's so amazing about all of it is just the fantastic letters I'm getting. Mm. Everybody writes such beautiful letters and you know, some make you laugh and some make you cry. I've got a huge box of letters that uh, people have written to us. And I'm just so proud of that. I said, it's so rewarding. Like today, I didn't expect what was going on today, but I've got candy, flowers, balloons, and so all kinds of cards. And it's so nice. It's just nice to know that what you've done is being recognized. I think that's nice. And like I said, it's the journey, getting there, all the wonderful people that I've met and associated with it. That's what I think that's where it's at, really, where it's at. Of course, the end results are so important for all of us. Right. Right. It's gonna it, it's gonna preserve your legacy and it's gonna um, support everyone. Um, so May, talk talk to me a little bit about when you were on when you were working on the home front. 
did you have this, were you, did you feel this sense of community? Because one thing I'll tell everyone, I'm, I'm on the committee to help design the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor and I'm with May and I'm with Phyllis and I'm, I'm with the, um, the, the, the Mint Department. And I was struck when I was on the phone conversation of how you were so, at, you're so adamant to have it be whatever design is, it needs to be inclusive, inclusive of all the women of all colors that worked on the home front. So I'm curious as when you worked on the home front, did you feel the sense that you're all into all in it together? Not at first we didn't. We, oh, don't forget I was a teenager, I was 17 years old. And I was just, we were going to Seattle just for the summer. We thought it would be fun. But as we worked, we decided after we'd been there for the summer, we decided we really liked it and we stayed. And of course, as you're getting in with this, you're, you're building these planes, you start to realize what you're doing, what we're doing for our fighting men. And the more you get into it, the more determined you are to do a good job and make sure our fighting men get what they need. One of the examples I just love to tell is about a gold star mother I worked with. She said she wouldn't stop working because she lost her son. She said, I don't want another mother to lose a son because he doesn't have the equipment he needs. And of course, we had the widows too, so many widows that lost their husbands. They hung right in there and, and did what our country needed. And I thought that's what, uh, to me, that was so amazing. That just proves what kind of women you know, we are. Up until 1941, it was a man's world. And they didn't know how capable American women were. And they sure found out we could do everything. And I'm proud of them. I'm proud of myself. May, what year did you start working on the home front? I began early 1943. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, okay, so now we have questions that are starting to roll in from our audience, which is, of course, um, a, a big part of the program. What is the next step? Let me see. Um, oh, it just it just popped off. It said, "What is the next step for the rosy recognition? What do you want to see happen next?" Oh, so now, I already got, yeah. I already got that plan. I'm even working on Boeing already. I want to see a statue of Rosie in the World War um, uh, the memorial down in Washington D.C. I've gone there with the honor flights, and I've been there other times, and it angers me to think that they didn't put anything in there for the women. They couldn't have won the war without. In fact, I was on with the Woody Wilson Wilson yesterday, the Medal of Honor winner for me, Redeema, and he had written the nicest letter to the Congress telling them that they couldn't have won the war without us women. And I was just on to thank him yesterday on a radio program. But it was so nice that uh, that that they cared. That the, it just I can't explain exactly what it felt like to. Uh, we just developed a feeling of uh, dedication. We didn't do anything that uh, we figured was, that wasn't that our country didn't need. I remember Hap Arnold coming through the factory and he'd stop and talk to us. He was at Vice Star General of Army Air, then we didn't have an Air Force. He'd stop and talk to us and shake our hands. And you know, we were so young and naive. I don't think we really realized at the time how important he was. So now when I go to the Pentagon, they, they just make a big fuss over that all the time because half Arnold's everywhere in the Pentagon. And they'll say, May, you're the only one in here who still cans with half Arnold's. But that's fun. It was just a it was a fun thing at the time. But like I said, we were so dedicated to what we were doing. Right. Yeah. Really, really was um an important, a very important effort. And I can imagine that. You know the idea of having having widows be part of it, or mothers who lost their sons, and how how um, I guess a question that's coming in is how much schooling did you get as a child before going and to work in high, high school? And when when school was out in the spring, we all decided to go. My girlfriend, my uh, my sister, my girlfriend, and I decided to go to Seattle for the summer. We thought it would be fun. We were teenagers having a good time. We weren't thinking of the war or production at the time. But just yesterday, I just got notice that my girlfriend died and that she'd lived out there. She stayed in Seattle, but we kept the, we kept our uh, communication all these years. We back and forth oh. all the time. And oh. so I'm the last of the three musketeers, as they call us. Call us. But uh, no, it was that we were all young. 
And when we were over, when Tammy took it through Normandy, there was five of us and three of us were in our early 90s. And we came from Minnesota, North Dakota, Arkansas, and I think Oregon, I forget. So we were from all states and we were all young when we went into aircraft and shipbuilding. Hmm. Did you did you um, feel because you went? I mean, I'm I'm curious. It sounds like it was quite the adventure when you went out to Seattle. But did you feel that you missed out on being a full fledged teenager, and maybe what you would have done at home, or would you any day trade that? Oh no! <laughs> Which I would always had a, a good example. It's the day Pearl Harbor was bombed. My sister and I had been to a matinee, and when we came home, my folks were sitting by the radio. All They're very upset, and we said, what had happened? They said, Japan had bombed Pearl Harbor. And I stood there for a while, and I thought, you know, I don't think I know where Pearl Harbor is. I mean, we were young and, and not sophisticated at the time, but when that was in 1941, and when we went to Seattle, of course, now here again, I'm having a good time. So us young ones, we used to work all day and dance half the night. That's when I met my husband's on the dance floor out in Seattle. And really? we were married almost 70 years before I lost him. Oh. But no, we had a good time besides working hard and dedicated to what we were doing. We still had a good time. Um, okay, this is from a nine-year-old Erica. And she says, you were only 17. What made you want to do something that you didn't have to do? And how did you find out about the job building airplanes? Well, for one thing, I'm an adventuresome person. I like the idea of doing something different. And it wasn't the idea of building planes. Uh, we heard Seattle, we heard Boeing was uh, hiring. We thought that would be fun for the summer. But uh, once you get into work, you know, 17 at that time, don't forget, we went through the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. We were much more mature at 17 than the children are today. So it was a whole lot easier for us to do that than it is. But today, I really preach now to you, you young lady. If you have a dream, you know, you follow your dream. Don't think that you can't do it. If then you look at the men or boys and you say, well, he's a man, he can do it better. He can't do it any better. If you have a dream, you can do it just as well as they can. So follow your dream. Somebody yeah. says, don't, don't follow your dreams, chase them. And I think that's true. You have such advantages today, and I think it's outstanding. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the things I'm um, at Rosie the Riveter Trust. We, you know, uh, in our support at the national park, um, we have a program for youth, and um, it was being called Rosie's Girls. Now we're calling it Rosie Service Corps because we want the element of community service in. But we take them to the park, and they talk to our Rosie ambassadors that are there, and it's really, you know, being able to look at someone who's gone through it and done it and chased their dreams and have come out on the other side feeling very empowered and then, you know, been that way all their life is, is the gift that we can give to our young girls and the next generations. And so I love that message of what you say, because it's so important for young girls to hear. You can do anything you want to do. You can do it just as well as boys and men. And for some instance, we have stories that the women working on the home front were able to do a better job because right. of their skills, their sewing skills, their being meticulous and being small. I always think of what uh, 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 Phyllis said. She said to the inspectors would inspect a weld that uh, she did. He said he would always knew that a woman did it because it was neater than what men did. And I know that's true with the riveting, the riveting too. I think the women, some of their hands are more agile. Maybe we can move, move like with the B-17. We can move a lot, a lot faster than the men. Uh, we just have that knack. But the, the Phyllis said they were paid the same in the aircraft, in the shipyards, but we were paid less than the men at Boeing. Uh, I don't know why we were doing the same work, but and we didn't fight it. We were too young. We didn't think anything of it. But uh, that was just the way it was at the time. Well, look, at they're still fighting that. I mean, yeah. we still, they say we're 90% there, but I don't think we're 90% yet. Women, not all, some women are getting the same uh, treatment, but not all women, if they can get them for less money than the man. And that's what right. they've been doing until they, right. I said, until we get that last 10%, we got to keep going, girls. Keep fighting yep. them. 
It, it needs to be equal. I have to do a shout out to one of my board members because he he just wrote, women are better, better welders. So that's from, that's from Warren Harbor, <laughs> one of our board members. So you're absolutely right, Warren. Uh, women are better at a lot of things. <laughs> that's right. Um, that I do. The cradle rolls of the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I do want to remind people, some people have used the raise hand feature. And for this, this event, we are just taking questions in the chat or in actually in the Q&A, if you'll, you'll see the Q&A down there. And so please just type in your question and we'll be happy to take it. So I have a couple more. Um, when the war ended, um, let, me, let me bring this over. And just a bell sounded, a machine screeched to a halt. Announcement, the war has ended, ladies, time to go home. Did you, did you, what did you do after that? Did you come back home or did you keep the job? Did you want to? And um, was it just given up to the soldiers when they came home? What, what, what was the environment? Tell me about the culture. No, when the war was over, we were just naturally uh, um, released. From a, no, I would no. My husband had been transferred just before the war was over, so I wasn't at, at Boeing when they closed. I was with the Army and um, Army Engineers, and uh, when the war was over, they we were just automatically. When the husbands were discharged, we were just automatically. Um, well, we left on our own, I believe, if I remember right. But uh, you know, don't forget the men. Uh, they were had points. They went by points when the war was over, and, uh, and so many points for overseas, and so many points for. Um, different um, areas where you were in. So my husband had a lot of points. He was discharged right away. So when we came back, he had worked for Westinghouse before the war. So he had a job. They were very good with their enlisted men. They kept them on. So he had a job to come home to. And a lot of them didn't. Of course, the men did come home and take the jobs and the women lost their jobs. But after the war, there were so many strikes because now they're retooling. They were making, instead of making war material, they were making radios and uh, I don't know if there's televisions yet then, but you know everything, the household uh, items. So Westinghouse, General Motors, General Electric, all of those places were striking. There were so many union problems. So sometimes after the war for several years, it was harder than it was during the, during the war. Well, not during the war, but before the war. So there was a struggle after the war too. Yeah. Um, so May, did you feel like like, when did you feel like, or did you feel like you were going to be a piece of history? Because for sure you're going down in the books of history, May. Did that, did you feel that back in not the a, day? No, not at all. Uh, it was for years before, um, just before the war was over when I was with the army engineers, I'd worked with Italian prisoners of war. They used to come in and help us. Uh, we were sending uh, equipment overseas for reconstruction. And then one day I started talking about that, and my son said to me, I never knew you were for the Italian of Prisoners of War. And I was stunned because I thought they, our children should know what we did during the war. So this is what at least 40 years ago I started. I thought the women should be recognized for what we did. They'll tell you, all those service men will tell you they couldn't have won the war without us. And so I just start writing, I'd write everywhere. Uh, and anyway, that would listen to me. They'd write back and say, thank you for your duty. And that would be the end of it. Some of them didn't even know who Rosie the Riveter was. But I didn't quit up. I, get, I didn't quit. Uh, I just, I was uh, persevered, I'll tell you. I did, like Senator Casey, I, teased, I said to him one day, the reason you gave me this award is because you were tired of hearing from me. <laughs> but he, he, was, he was good. And, and Jackie Spears, Congressman Fitzpatrick, and several out near California area that I don't I remember. Uh, and I know the names, but I can't remember them. But they were just wonderful the way they honored us and kept, you know, hung right in there with us all the while we were fighting for these, the women's rights. And I thought that was so nice. But I never got recognized until the early 2000s. One of the newspapers picked up on my story. And it, after that, it just snowballed. I started getting invited everywhere. And it was nice. So May, you, you know, you, you talk about that um, you were just relentless, like you, you kept writing letters, you kept writing letters, people said, oh, thank you, thank you for your work, thank you for your service, but it wasn't done. At what point, so you have been working for 40 years from what I've heard, right. to get this, to get the, to get the notable and be recognized with this Congressional Gold Medal of Honor, which happened last year. Talk to me about when did you get 
when did that get planted in your head to get well, the no, Congressional the, Gold the, Medal of Honor? And well, how did you persevere? The, the gold medal wasn't into the picture at the beginning. Only getting, I was really working to get our first National Rose of the Riveter Day. I wanted us to be a national um, recognition. I thought it was a shame. I, I just think it was a shame that they didn't recognize the women. And so I just didn't let up. I'd write to everybody, read veterans, newspapers, television stations, and they'd write back. Most of them would answer me. But uh, until I get the newspaper re uh, article out, well, then it went all over. And uh, it, it was just amazing the results I started to get. And of course, we have, now we've had the Rosie River, the National Rosie River Day. And Senator Casey had called me and told me that they're talking about the gold medal. This was about three or four years ago. Uh, and and I said he said, but you know that there was only talk at the time, and so when he told me that they were going to in, introduce it, well, then that's when we really started to work. But the nicest thing that uh, come about with getting this medal is uh, when uh, when my mask went viral, we picked up over fifty five hundred followers, and they were just fabulous. They stay right on there with us all the time. And we had uh, my last trip down to Washington. We picked up Ro uh, Rubio from Florida. I picked up another one from Florida too. But that was how we would get them to, you know, face to face. We could get them to to uh, sign on with us. But when this when this went um, uh, viral, it was, it was so funny because of, um, oh gosh, I lost track of what I was saying here. But anyway, uh, we on Facebook with our you know, over fifty five thousand, close to six, I think we think out. Anyway, when we told them. That uh, we just we made a list of all of the uh, men that hadn't signed on, all the senators and representatives who hadn't signed on yet. Well, they all went after their senator employee in no time at all. We got those extra uh, uh, people to sign on, and Casey was really surprised because we were stuck at twenty nine for the longest time, and we needed sixty, and it was oh uh, it was fabulous. So if you know numbers really help when you get um, you know a lot of people behind you. It really will snowball because we were stuck there for quite a while. The house did great. Oh, Jackie Spears, she's just worth her weight in gold. I'll tell you, oh. she's just fabulous. Uh, and so it just, you know, they just seemed to stick together and work for us. It was so nice. Senator Casey said, May, he says, you're an unpaid lobbyist. I had to laugh when he said that. <laughs> of course, the virus stopped me from going to Washington. But uh, that's nice when you can go and read them. It, it's so much easier to get them to sign on if you can read them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. May, what what was your feeling with the GI Bill? Did you feel at the time that maybe there should have been some sort of educational benefit to women who also served during the war? No, I don't think, no, I didn't give any thought to that. Um, you know, at that time, women's place was still in the home. That's the way they, they thought of women. And I don't think that the GI Bill, I know a lot of them come back and went into like television training, just different, come back to school, things like that. But I don't know of any women that did. Uh, well, of course, there weren't the women weren't the veterans, so they would the DI bill didn't pay for them. But some of the men took advantage of it, which was nice. Some of them went mm -hmm. and got their their degrees, their college degrees. But mm -hmm. uh, I think it was beneficial for the men coming home. Right. Yeah, I know a lot of a lot of uh, people that were in the war really were able to further their education. I had family members that did too. Yeah. Well, get, you know, get, get back to our gold medal. It was so funny because of when, um, when my mask went viral, I didn't know how I was going to handle all this by myself. And this friend of mine, Deb Wilson, from she's on the other side of Philly, I'm on the east side, she's on the west side. She called me, she says, May, can I help you? And oh my God, she's been she's worth her weight in gold. I couldn't do it alone. She just does everything for me. She's even got Boeing, Boeing sending out of a lot of her packages now. She just has been absolutely fantastic. You know, it's so it's so nice when you start something like this. How many good people will join up with you and help you? You know, you can't do it alone, and it's just absolutely amazing. And Deb's worth her weight in gold. I'll tell you. Mm. Yeah. She sort of reminds me of Tammy. That's what Tammy does. She just signs up and she just works for everybody. <laughs> well, I think it's important that everyone gets to know who Tammy is. Will you introduce Tammy, May, well, at sure this time? Will. Let people know who Tammy Brunley is? I thought they all knew Tammy out there. Tammy, are you on? Tammy? Oh, there she is, there Tammy. Is. <laughs> Tammy, I want to tell you something about this Tammy here. 
I met her as I was leaving the, the convention out in California. I had written to Tammy, not knowing her. And just as I was leaving, she, we just found out who each other was. We never got to know each other. But I met her at the, at the convention in, in New Orleans and someplace else. But we didn't really have a lot to do until the day she called me and said, May, would you like to go to Normandy with us? Well, God, I fell in love with that woman in a minute. I said, oh, what an <laughs> outstanding trip. Tammy works like Debbie does. They do it out of their heart. They don't do it for money. They don't do it for any reason other than just they're just genuine good people. That's you, Tammy. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure, May. You're a wonderful person to work with. I love doing it. I love to be able to share this, the Rosie story with everybody. And that's, that's my goal. Well, you, you do such a good job with it. Wherever we've gone, wherever I've been with you. Oh, that's right. Well, Tammy and I went to Oklahoma City too. We were invited to, the two of us were invited to Oklahoma City. And it's just so nice because it's, it's, it's just really nice to share what we, we know and what we do. And they like us, don't they, Tammy? I, I think they really love you. <laughs> oh, they like us. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I came in, I came into my position a year ago. And when I first heard of Tammy, they called her the Rosie Wrangler. Because <laughs> since, since the beginning now. of and uh, the, since the beginning that Tammy started volunteering for the national park as a docent, she took on the, you know, being able to organize and make sure the, the Rosies that we have in our area in California um, would come to the visitor center on a weekly basis and help them um, be able to share their story with the visitors, which then I think kind of grew into speaking engagements, being part of parades, and then the traveling. So that's what you guys got to do is Tammy was the really the one behind all the logistics and all the fundraising and traveling and, and bringing everyone to Normandy, to Washington, D.C., all these incredible trips. So, so you our hats off Tammy to you, took, Tammy. If Tammy took a five of us women, all in our 90s, for 15 days in France, uh, wow. that was absolutely amazing. I didn't see a flaw in the whole thing. And I said, that takes a lot of, uh, of courage to, you know, at our age to take us there and see that they just did everything for us, Greg and her and, Tam, and their, their daughter, uh, Shannon. It was outstanding. And I thank you, Tammy. I thank you every day. Thank you. It's my pleasure. My pleasure working with all of you, all of you Rosies, Phyllis and, and the other Rosies at the park and, and May. Thank you, Rosie. Well, May, we, we still do, we have some more questions coming in and um, a lot of people are saying happy birthday. We just happy birthday, sweet May from Julie, Ellen, Becky, all these wonderful things. Um, Becky has a question. What things can we do to help get the Rosies the recognition they deserve and keep their stories alive in the forefront? Now you talked about one of the ways with which happened with the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor when you had 25 of the, the congressmen, they were said yes, but you needed, what was that, 60. And the to. social meet your followers, right? Your 6,000 mm -hmm. plus people really kind of went to bat for you and started just making yep. contact with those. What would you say people can do now? I mean, it sounds like absolutely they should follow you on social media. Well, now, it's, when we had this temp uh, affair just two weeks ago with the CEO of Boeing, Congressman, uh, our Congressman Fitzpatrick and Senator Casey, we were all on with eight schools from our local area. And uh, they did a beautiful STEM program. They were they're, they're promoting space. Uh, they want to make sure the kids study their, you know, their, their math. And it was a really promotional in space, which was really nice. And when they got done, they said to me, now stay on, May, we got a surprise for you. And the CEO from Boeing came on. He said, May, we're going to put your uh, um, face mask and your bandana on Rosie, the rocketeer, and she's going in up to the National Space Station. Wow. Isn't that amazing to get our bandana into space? I just think that's, that's outstanding. I mean, the gold medal was great, but they'll always remember Rosie the Riveter now, I think. 
Well, I think, I think we'll, I think, I think we'll always remember it, but I have to say that there is a huge, there's a swatch of the population and of young people that don't know anything about Rosie the Riveter. They might recognize the button that you're wearing today. They may recognize it, but they really don't know the, what it stands for and the history of it. And I think that our work is far from being done. Yes, what do you that's think? True. That's we. That's why we got to go into schools, like the girls that uh, come and speak at your park. It's so important, and I speak a lot of times in schools in different places. And I think these you've got to reach the kids while they're young or the young people. Uh, a lot of them, not, uh, they got sort of got a, a, a seed planted there, something they like. But if they hear something that uh, you know they really like, then they get more interested and start asking questions. After I'm on one of these STEM programs, quite often I'll get students that'll call me and want to know more. And I think that's so nice. Now I've got on Facebook, I've got a, a, a group from Minnesota, a group from Harrisburg. They're young people that want to perform as Rosie the Riveter. So they want to either, some of them even come to meet me, but they do a full program on them. And two different ones have made the state state program with their, or the state the affair with their, their Rosie program. And that what makes us proud too because they're young people and they're promoting it. If the young promote it, that's great. Yeah. Um, well, and, and people were, you know, you did mention that you're working to get a monument built in Washington, DC on the mm -hmm. mall right. to represent the women who worked on the home front during World War II. I certainly think that that, um, that is a worthwhile effort for you to, to garner up your troops and to <laughs> move forward. And you know what I love about this is that I'm sure that 40 years ago when you started writing these letters or whatever amount of time is that literally, because this is how we did it, we took um, pen to paper, we wrote the letters and then we licked the envelope and put the stamp on. And now here you are these years later when we have the methods and the internet and such that we do, and you are the spokeswoman. I'm sure you can dial up a radio station or a TV and say, I wanna speak about something. And then we can all be behind you and we can help you move forward and ask for this monument at the Washington Mall. So well, I just wanna say that I think that um, there's 90 people here on this call plus, I know some are sitting in groups and you uh, with your social media of over 6,000, you know, you're really, you're really in a key position to um, get all your dreams to come true, May. Well, it's so funny because people say, well, you know, that's very difficult to get anything done in that ball in Washington. And I said, well, it wasn't easy getting the gold medal and the flag into space either. So you just got to be, when you've got a dream, I, I tell the girls, if you got something you want done, don't give up. I guess you yeah. just call me. Yeah, I just, I persevere. I guess that's what you call it. Yeah, but, uh, just, it, I always wanted the, the, the Rosies to be honored. I just thought it was so unfair that they didn't, weren't honored after the war. And, and I just, just stuck and I just kept working on it. Wow. Well, it is, it is such a, it's such a pleasure to have you. And, and what, what a phenomenal day this is. This is really the day that you have helped create the Rosie the Riveter Day. And um, I know that Courtney is holding something in the wings and I'm hoping that it, at this time she will present something that's from all of us. Um, so Courtney, I know that oh. you can, I know you can hear us. I'm here, I'm bringing it over. All right, I'm here. I tried taking it out and I hit it a little bit, but. Oh no, Rose is not <laughs> Yeah, can I'm you... gonna try and move the camera so everyone okay. can see it without me taking it out because I already accidentally got my finger in it. Okay. There we go. Oh, everyone you can did see it. it. Happy birthday, May. What a beautiful oh, cake. Thank you. That's a beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Even got my name on it. Isn't it nice? Yeah. Thank you so much. That's so nice. I've just gotten balloons and flowers and cards and candy and cake and it's just so nice. Well, may we wish you a beautiful, happy, happy birthday. And we love you. And we can't wait to see you in person. And I know that um, one thing I do want to remind people is that Rosie the Riveter Trust is having a virtual event on April 11th. 
and you will be able to hear from May and Phyllis and other uh, Rosie ambassadors at that time. So that's April 11th at 5 p.m. Uh, West Coast time. And we also have uh, an event, an online auction that goes April 1st to 11th that Tammy has um, is really played a, a huge role. And I'm sure that Tammy has quite a number of memorabilia from the Rosies in, in the online event. So if you are interested in joining us on April 11th for our event and also for our online fundraiser, um, no, it's not a fundraiser, it's a online auction. Just go to our home website. It's rosytheriveter.org, rosytheriveter.org. And um, we do look forward to seeing. Do you have anything to say about the online auction, Tammy? Well, we have a very special item that we hope because they're not being made for the public anymore. So we're hoping that people will tune in and, and try to bid on a set of signed uh, maize bandana and uh, masks that we have featured on the, on the online auction. So many other goodies, but that's a very special one. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, May. And we just want you to have a beautiful birthday. We're thinking about you. And for everyone that tuned in today, thank you so much from Rosie the Riveter Trust. And if you want to know about other programs that we do, please follow us on social media and go to our website and sign up. So rosytheriveter.org. May, thank you so much. Happy birthday. And Courtney, you are an angel. You helped yes, make yes. this happen. There you are. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you guys for thank everything you. you do for her. And thank everyone for showing up. She is the best great grandmother I could ever ask for. <laughs> <laughs> and thank oh. you for the beautiful flowers you sent before. Our pleasure. We we do yes, want we we celebrate you, May. Thank you so much for all that you do. Well, and thank you. Thank you, Lisa Foot, for putting this together. This has been awesome. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day and evening. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Okay. Bye everyone.